Today's lesson is the inspiration of Scripture. This is probably the most important lesson throughout the entire series that we'll look at because the Bible is the foundation for all that we believe. The Bible is our source of truth. It is the guidebook that God has given to us how to live this life, not only in this earth, but to make heaven our home one day. The scripture itself says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. I'd like for us to focus for just a few minutes just on those first few words that say, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. This Bible that we have is not an ordinary book. It's not just ink on paper. It's something that's holy and something very precious, and it's something that's timeless and eternal. It is God's Word. Now, the way in which God conveyed this Word to us is absolutely a miracle. When that says all Scripture, it's talking about both the Old Testament and the New Testament. All the Scripture that we have is given by the inspiration of God. What does that word inspiration actually mean? I'm not a Greek scholar, but I did take a Greek class and learned a little bit and uh, know enough to be able to search some of the tools that are available today for Bible study. And I found out that that particular word in the Greek, if you were to translate it into an English pronunciation, is theonoustos. And it literally means God breathed. It's, it's actually God imparting to those that penned the Word of God through whatever means they had in that ancient time so that it could be conveyed to us even to this generation. It's an incredible thing to think about how God uh, worked through various people through centuries of time to give to us the Bible. The Bible itself was written over a period of about 1600 years. That's a long time. And then take into consideration that there are approximately 40 authors that were used. And you, you might say, why do we say approximately? Well, because there is some debate, for example, about who wrote the book of Hebrews. The book does not declare itself an author, and so some people assume it was the Apostle Paul. Some have suggested maybe Luke and others. So there in that particular book, we don't know for sure the Bible does not declare for itself who the author is as it does in some of the other books of the Bible. And so we know about 40 authors were used. Those 40 authors spanning that period of time of 1,600 years, by the Holy Spirit wrote down the words that they were given, doing so in the vernacular that they were accustomed to and able to communicate with, and that's how we come up with a Bible that's made up of 66 books in total. Some of those books are very short in length. They're a short letter, a single chapter. And then you have some books that are very lengthy, that stand alone almost as far as their length and the size of their content. But the Bible, when you look at it from Genesis to Revelation, the unique characteristic of the Bible is that even though it was over such a long span of time, even though you had so many authors that were a part of the process that the Holy Spirit used, you still have a single message that is conveyed. There is a thread of redemption, we call it, that runs from Genesis to Revelation. You can look all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, and there you find record of the redemptive story. We know that God had created Adam and Eve. They lived in the garden, and then sin entered in through disobedience. But then here in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, you see the first reference to the Messiah that will one day come to save us from our sins. It says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, and she shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. That was speaking of Jesus. 
And that was speaking of the battle that would be waged between him and Satan to win back for us the right of redemption. And so this thread of redemption runs from Genesis, and then I said all the way to Revelation, which we have as the last book in the New Testament. And as you read in the book of Revelation, you discover that God completes the work. There's a new heaven and a new earth. And it says in chapter 22, verses 12 and 13, And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And so the completed work will be accomplished. All that is in this miracle book we call the Bible. It's the scriptures that we use in the ministry. And it's the scriptures we should use in every one of our lives to live according to the truth that God has given to us. And it tells us that this word is profitable to teach us, to instruct us, and to guide us. And as you prepare for ministry, and as you participate in ministry, it's important to understand that this becomes the manual by which you are going to help people live life according to God's will. We call this Bible an Old Testament and a New Testament, an Old Covenant and a New Covenant. But another way it could be described is the old will and the new will and testament that God has given to us. And so by it, we know how to live for God. Now, as I said earlier, this was God-breathed. In other words, this wasn't just the intellect of a man. It wasn't just that he was particularly articulate and sat down and began to write good thoughts about God or about people. No, it was something that came from God. It was God by the Holy Spirit imparting, and he uses the terminology of breathing. God breathed in to those who would author and pen the words of Scripture. And so by that, he literally was giving to them the things to say, the words to speak. Some people refer to this as plenary verbal inspiration of Scripture. In other words, God gave them the words to speak. Now, there's a unique dynamic that happened because you know, and maybe if you've studied the scriptures, you know that the Bible is written by a variety of people, written by people from various experiences in life and people that have uh, all kinds of backgrounds that are unique and special. For example, you have those that were statesmen like Daniel. You have those that were prophets like Isaiah, warriors like David. You have Amos, who was a shepherd. You have Peter and John that were fishermen. Uh, you have Moses, who wrote words of the law. Joshua, who was a general. So you have all these varied backgrounds of people that God uses to give to us the Scripture. The Scripture came through those different individuals. It's interesting, as well, that God used their level of understanding of language and the ability to communicate. Even though we believe that God gave them the words to speak, He took that from what was within them, their ability to communicate. I remember, I told you earlier that I did study a little bit of Greek. Well, I remember in that class, when they were trying to teach us how to translate, they selected one of the books of the Bible that had a simpler grammatical structure than some that were more complex. And I'll give you an example. John, whose education level as a fisherman was not equivalent to, say, Luke's, who was a physician, he wrote in a simpler grammatical structure, where Luke was a little more complex. And so as they were teaching us the language, they, they allowed us to use some of the, the easier passages in the beginning to try to learn the language. Well, God took all, that, all those factors, all those dynamics, and worked within those individuals by the Holy Spirit to give to us the Word of God. And it is a powerful Word of God that has everlasting truth, and it's something that we can cling to. If you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to turn with me, and we'll look into this a little further as we look at uh, 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 2, and I want us to read in the scripture there 
some of the things that are spoken concerning the Word of God. Second Peter chapter 2, because this is a powerful passage that will help us to understand more about the Word of God and what it has to say. Second Peter, I said chapter 2, it's actually chapter 1, and I want to read verses 20 and 21. It says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. What are we talking about? We're talking about the inspiration of Scripture. That this is not an ordinary book. Now, you know that the Bible is the world's bestseller. This Bible has been translated into more language than any other book because it's recognized worldwide by most as a holy book, as something that's set apart. But even those that are detractors recognize the influence of Scripture and how powerful it really is. It's a force to be reckoned with because it's the Word of God. And it is everlasting truth. And there have been many uh, leaders who have risen up to try to stamp out the Word of God, but they've never been able to do so because even Jesus made mention of this when he said in Matthew chapter 5, Verse 18, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. That's found in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 18. So Jesus himself gave his stamp of approval to the fact that this was something special. Now, there's other ways that you can think about the Bible. First of all, you may be thinking, well, you're using the Bible to, to prove the Bible. And that may at first seem like it lacks credibility, but remember what I told you about the 1,600 years and the 40 different authors. Uh, you today can travel to the Middle East. You can go to Israel and surrounding regions, and you can see evidence of what the Bible speaks of. There's archaeological revelation that proves and shows you that this, the events and the circumstances spoken of in the Bible actually happened. It really did happen. There's not a debate as to whether Jesus lived. There's evidences to be found as you go into Jerusalem and you travel through Capernaum and out throughout Galilee in that region. But, yes, people debate other factors. Was he the Son of God? And certainly we know that he is. But the truth is there's evidence that what this Word of God talks about is factual. But on top of that, when you look at the Bible, you discover that there were things written in those early centuries that I spoke of that were later fulfilled in what we read in the New Testament, and in particular about Jesus. I'd like for us to take a moment and go back to the book of Isaiah, for example. Turn with me, if you would, in your Bible to Isaiah. And let's take a look just for a moment at Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, you know that that's a passage that talks about the suffering servant or the Messiah that it was to come. And it prophesies many things about Jesus. And when you read through these prophecies in this book, you discover... They are fulfilled in the New Testament. And I'm going to give you a list. This particular list that I'm going to work from, I found noted in the Spirit-Filled Life Bible. And it's a wonderful ready reference that you can look at. And I'll give it to you here. First of all, the prophecy. In Isaiah 52, 13, it says, He will be exalted. In Philippians 2 and verse 9, you see the fulfillment of that. The prophecy of Isaiah 52, 14 and 53, 2. He will be disfigured by suffering. And you can read the account in Mark 15, verses 17 and 19 of his crucifixion. He will make a blood covenant, Isaiah 52, 15. 1 Peter 1, 2 speaks of that being fulfilled. He will be widely rejected, Isaiah 53, 1 and 3. John 12, verses 37 and 38 give us the fulfillment of that. He will bear our sins and our sorrows, Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5. 
That's fulfilled in Romans 4, 25, and 1 Peter 2, 24 and 25. He will be our substitute, Isaiah 53, 6 and verse 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 talks about how he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we could become the righteousness of God in Christ. So it was fulfilled through him. He will voluntarily accept our guilt and our punishment, Isaiah 53, verses 7 and 8. Well, in John 10, verse 11, and chapter 19, verse 30, that's fulfilled. He will be buried in a rich man's tomb, Isaiah 53, 9. John 19, verses 38 through 42, record how Joseph of Arimathea came to take the body of Jesus to give him a proper burial after he had died on the cross. He will save us who believe in him, Isaiah 53, 10 and 11. Well, we know from John 3, 16 that he died for us, for, all, for God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son that whoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Acts 16, 31. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So there's the promise fulfilled. And then finally, he will die on behalf of trans our transgressors. Excuse me. He will die on behalf of transgressors. Isaiah 53, 12 and Mark 15, 27 and 28 and Luke 22, 37 all speak of that fulfillment. What are we talking about? I'm talking about the inspiration of Scripture. Here you have a prophet that prophesied hundreds of years before Jesus. Jesus came and fulfilled every one of these particular prophecies. And this is not all that was spoken of Jesus. This is just one list from, I said Isaiah 53, but it's really chapters 52 and 53. These prophecies all fulfilled. You can go back just in the book of Isaiah alone. Isaiah chapter 9 excuse me, in Isaiah 9, in verse 6, it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That was fulfilled when Jesus came and was born. The angels announced that he would come, and he would bring peace on earth, goodwill toward men. If you go past Isaiah 53 into Isaiah 61. You'll remember in Luke chapter 4, Jesus came into the synagogue, was called upon to read the scriptures. He took the scroll of Isaiah 61, and he read this passage, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God and to comfort all who mourn. He spoke those words and then he said, this day, this is fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, Jesus said, these words are about me. He read the prophecy of Isaiah 61 and confirmed that that prophecy was being fulfilled in him. He was the Messiah. You see, the scriptures are miraculous. For the accuracy of prophecies and the fulfillment of prophecies to happen, it's absolutely mind-boggling. Dr. D. James Kennedy, uh, who, who now has passed, but years ago made the statement, he said, if you were to take... Uh, these prophecies and figure the probability, the statistical probability of them, them being fulfilled, it would be equivalent to covering the state of Texas with silver dollars and then having someone take one silver dollar and, and paint an X on it, take it out into the middle of the state and just put it in the pile of the state as it was covered in one foot deep of silver dollars and then someone send someone from the other side to come out and find that one X on that silver dollar in other words it's it's ridiculous to think that it could happen yet it did why because it was ordered of the Lord the Bible is not an ordinary book 
The Bible is a unique and a powerful book which God has given to us. And God worked through these various people from various backgrounds, social, economic, educational, all kinds of diversity. And he worked in a dynamic nature with them to convey to us the word of God that we hold fast today that has that everlasting uh, quality about it, a quality which we can count on to never fade and to never pass. In fact, it says in the scripture, beginning in verse, excuse me, 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in the 22nd verse, speaking of the enduring word, it says, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth, okay, what is the truth? It's God's word. Through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible. And you ask, how? The answer is right here. Through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. Did you hear that? The Word, which lives and abides forever. This Word is a living book. You say, well, it's just ink and paper. I understand that it's conveyed to us through ink and paper. And now we have electronic means and every sort of way in which we can get the Word of God, and that's a wonderful thing. But here what it's telling us is this Word of God, there's life in it. It's a living book. Yes, it comes alive when we apply it faith. But this book is a living book. It's a powerful book. And so I'm going to come back to that, but even as we're talking about how it comes alive by faith, we know this book instructs our faith and enables faith to grow in us. It enables us. Romans chapter 10, uh, the scripture tells us in Romans 10 verse 17, So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So this very word that can transform us by faith is the thing that builds our faith as we hear the word of God. So the word of God provides the avenue through which we can be saved. So it says here, having been born again, not of corruptible seed. See, the word is not corruptible. It's incorruptible. Through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. And then speaking of the everlasting nature of God's Word, he goes on to say it this way, quoting again from the Old Testament, from Isaiah chapter 40, and says, All flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and its flower falls away, but the Word of the Lord endures forever. Remember what Jesus said about the Word? Heaven and earth shall not heaven and earth shall disappear, but not one jot or tittle, the Old Testament or the uh, King James says, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of the pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Let me read on. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word by which the gospel was preached to you. You're preparing for ministry. And as you do so, know that your foundation and your anchor is in the Word of God. We believe in the moving of the Spirit. We believe in the prophetic Word. We believe in the presence of angels. But even if an angel were to come to you, and the Apostle Paul made the same, even if an angel were to come to you with a new doctrine, if it does not line up with the Bible, the everlasting Word of God, you should reject it and never allow for it to be a part of your life. Everything you ever receive, prophetically or by the Spirit of God, should line up with the Word of God. It should be something that you can hold to as a foundational truth, and you can check everything by the Word of God, because it's that Word that's everlasting and enduring. I want you to see here in the book of Hebrews something that it says concerning the Word. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1. It 
it says God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the worlds. In other words, it confirms to us that God has spoken throughout generations of time and he's spoken to those that would receive, those that would listen and hear by faith. And that's how we have the word of God today. It is a powerful word that we can hold fast to and know that God has prepared it. One other thing I'd like to share with you that is a confirmation, again, of the uniformity of God's plan in the Scripture and the power of the Scripture is that not only were there prophecies that spoke of Jesus, but there are also types and symbols and ceremonies that are seen throughout the Scripture, even the tabernacle and the temple, which give us a picture of Christ and the work of Christ done for us through his death, burial, and resurrection. I'll not take the time to go into all those, but give you a quick example. If you read in Exodus chapter 12 about the Passover, and you read in there various aspects of the Passover, how the lamb was to be selected and the, the lamb was to be checked out for four days. They were to keep the lamb to make sure there were no blemishes, no sickness, no illness. Do you know as Jesus came, there was a period of time when he was being checked out prior to his uh, death, burial, and res resurrection. He was checked out by Pilate. He was observed by Caiaphas. He had been arrested by him. And the truth is, none of them could truly find fault in him, and Pilate said it best. He said, I find no fault in this man. The charges that had been made against him had been trumped up. The, the stirring of the people was aroused by the, the very uh, satanic powers of hell to come against Jesus. But he fulfilled his mission. But the scripture spoke of those things and prepared us. When you go back to Exodus chapter 12 and you read about the Passover, you hear about the blood. When the blood was applied, it said the blood would be applied to the doorpost and to the lentil. And it said when the death angel would come, he would see the blood and would pass over you. How are we redeemed today but by the blood? Scripture says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. That picture of Jesus was seen all the way back in the book of Exodus chapter 12. I'd already read to you from Genesis 3. But in that, in that Passover uh, act and what happens through the sacrifices, through the blood that is put on the doorpost and the lentil, and through the practices of the sacrifice, all that is a picture of of Jesus. The various aspects of going into the tabernacle of the wilderness where there's the washing of the hands, the showbread, uh, the altar and, and the incense and the blood. All that's a picture of Jesus and the revelation that he would bring to us. And so again in the Bible you have these very deliberate things that are spoken but you also have those things that are within to be revealed by the Holy Spirit. This book that we have is an incredible book. And of course you have to remember it was written by our Creator. You can say, well, it's the book of Isaiah. And a lot of times when I'm preaching, I'll, I'll read from Ephesians and I'll say something like, and Paul said, or I'll read from the Gospel of John. John said, and you read those and you say those kinds of things, but we all need to be reminded that what we're saying is the Holy Spirit, through John, gives us this word. The Holy Spirit, through Paul, gives us this word. The Holy Spirit, through Luke, and on and on, gives us that word. It is a powerful word, and it's an everlasting word. And it'll last far beyond this universe. The scripture tells us, and I'll close with this, in Psalm 119, verse 89, it says, Your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Your word, O Lord, is eternal, and it stands firm in the heavens. Stand fast with this word of God. Don't falter from it. It is the authority by which we live our life. It's the authority upon which we preach the gospel. 
and teach His Word, and it's the truth that can transform and change lives. You can lean heavy on the Word of God, and it will hold you every single time. God bless you.